investigators on the scene of a drug overdose find themselves matching wits with a serial killer. Something in the water has killed an office worker in Arizona. Her colleagues are lucky to be alive. Now detectives must decipher a mass poisoner's chilling agenda. When a healthy woman is found dead in her bath, investigators know she didn't drown on her own. Chemistry confirms there's more here than meets the eye. But can it lead them to the killer? Our material world is built on just 113 kinds of atoms. Their combinations can produce a world of good, but in the wrong hands, they're just bad medicine. At 10 a.m. on Saturday, December 10, 1994, Detroit police arrived at the hotel suite of Lowell and Roberta Amos, just one block from police headquarters. Lowell had reported that his wife had overdosed on cocaine and was dead. Police found a cocaine straw and playing card in the nightstand, but no signs of the drug. Mr. Amos said he panicked and flushed it when he woke to discover that his wife was dead. To police, it seemed that Amos had done more than dispose of the cocaine. The room was neat as a pin, practically scrubbed clean. The bedding where the victim lay, however, was thoroughly soiled and smeared from side to side. So how much more you got to work on there? Though the victim wore no makeup, the pillowcase was saturated with cosmetics. When the medical examiner removed the victim, it was clear that she had been dead several hours before police were notified. Suspicions arose that there was more here than Amos was telling. Homicide was called in, and Lowell Edward Amos gave police his account of what happened that night. I got it. Roberta Amos was last seen with her husband in the hotel suite of his business partner, Norbert Crabtree, and his girlfriend, Darcy Smith. The event was the company Christmas party, and executives were given suites at the hotel so they wouldn't have to drive afterward. Though Lowell and Roberta Amos were unofficially separated, she agreed to accompany him to the party. Afterward, Crabtree had invited Lowell and Roberta to his suite to continue celebrating. They stayed until 4.30 a.m. Lowell told police that after they returned to their suite, they made love and started doing cocaine. Lowell fell asleep while Roberta continued using the drug. He said that she had sinus trouble and couldn't snort it, so she found other ways to get it into her system. She must have overdosed while he slept. Because drugs were involved, he was afraid to call the police right away and flushed the remainder. But that didn't adequately explain why he waited so long to call authorities. Swabs taken from the victim's vaginal area tested positive for traces of cocaine. Other than that, there were no other external signs of the drug. That was strange. Internally, she had 14 times more cocaine than is normally seen in an overdose. She died before half of it was broken down. 
In cocaine poisoning, death is preceded by violent convulsions. Forensic chemist Phyllis Good believed that Amos could not have shared the victim's bed and slept through that. In fact, he probably couldn't have fallen asleep at all. Well, cocaine is a central nervous system stimulant and has the effect of keeping a person awake and full of energy. Uh, it's not the usual case that a person would go to sleep right after they've used cocaine. Get this sheet off of here, that should be the last thing we need. Lowell Amos did his best to clean up the scene, but his story of his wife's death just wasn't washing. Now, investigators had to prove that he killed her. At the Michigan State Police Crime Lab, Phyllis Good examined the bed sheet to determine what caused the stains. Nothing in Lowell Amos's scenario could have accounted for their condition. Because the victim's body was so clean, they suspected that Lowell had washed it before he called police. Investigators hoped some evidence remained in the linens. The sheet was treated with chemicals to more clearly reveal the stains. Portions were cut out and labeled. Because the stains occurred on virtually all portions of the sheet, Good took samples from all areas. The same process was repeated with the pillowcase to see if anything besides makeup could be identified. The pattern of the smudges suggested that the pillow wasn't simply wiped across the victim's face. What appeared to be uh, lipstick or characterized as lipstick is that there is an imprint on the pillowcase of what uh, had appeared to be imprint of uh, teeth, teeth marks. And they are located in this area under the blue spot. The blue coloration is from laboratory testing. People at the Christmas party told police that they had seen the victim wearing makeup. When her body was found, she had none, but the pillow revealed she went to bed wearing it. Apparently, she had bitten hard on the pillow, or the pillow had been pushed hard into her face before she died. A bruise on her nose suggested that it was pressed with tremendous force. The samples from the pillowcase and sheet were sent to the state police crime lab for analysis. Investigators awaited the results. <laughs> Meanwhile, police interviewed Norbert Crabtree and a business associate. He admitted that on the day of the death, Lowell Amos had phoned his room at 8.30 a.m. saying he needed help. He wasn't specific. Crabtree, who was awakened by the call, didn't arrive until 9.30 with another business associate. Lowell told them that Roberta was dead and gave them a bag to hold for him. Detective Patrick Hennahan was assigned to the case. The items were described as a, uh, a washcloth from the hotel linen that uh, was stained and very foul smelling, a uh, sport coat, and a syringe without a needle in a small leather type carrying case. Amos collected the items from his friends later. Investigators never recovered them. To determine what happened, they had to rely on the evidence at hand, namely the bed sheet and pillowcase. The lab results showed traces of cocaine throughout the sheet, but that was all. The results of the test were the lack of urine or presence of urine, the lack of a semen or a seminal fluid, and the only thing that was identified in the brown areas was uh, characterized as vegetative matter. The identity of the brown stains was inconclusive, they shed no light on what happened, only deepening the mystery. The fact that the cocaine was also smeared around the sheet and tucked under the sides merely told investigators what they already knew, that Lowell Amos had manipulated the scene. 
either out of fear of being blamed for contributing to his wife's death, or to hide the evidence that proved he murdered her. As investigators mulled over which it could be, Lowell Amos's past began to catch up with him. It seemed that Amos may have been a real lady killer. As word spread of the investigation into the death of Roberta Amos, investigators in Detroit learned much about the suspect, Lowell Amos. He had an unsettling history with women. Two came forward who said that before he married Roberta, they met him at a bar, had drinks with him, and woke up in his apartment with no recollection of how they had gotten there. Other women reported becoming violently ill after being intimate with him. They claimed they'd been drugged. But the most astonishing revelations were yet to come. I began to receive phone calls from uh, relatives, received phone calls from doctors, private investigators, police officers, friends uh, from as far away as Oregon. Uh, most of the information that was coming in was in regards not just to Roberta Maori Amos, but also her husband Lowell Amos. I was advised that this was not his first wife to die at a young age. Uh, under suspicious circumstances. None of the deaths were considered criminal at the time, but times had changed and the death of Roberta Amos shed new light on old events. In 1994, Michigan amended its rules of evidence. Past incidents could now be entered into a current criminal trial. If Amos's dark history could be shown to have some bearing on Roberta's death, the case against him would be the first one tried under the new rules. Nancy Westveld, assistant prosecuting attorney for Wayne County, Michigan, was brought in to see if the rules applied to Lowell Edward Amos. If somehow we could demonstrate what Mr. Amos's real intentions were by looking back and looking at these other women, looking at their lives, looking at their deaths, looking at how Ed Amos had treated them, and in the end, what he did to them as they died. The first Mrs. Amos, Sandra Amos, died in 1979 at age 36. The couple had been married nine years. According to Lowell, Sandra mixed Dalmain, a sedative, with wine and must have collapsed and hit her head on the bathroom counter. Though Sandra's autopsy revealed traces of Dalmain and alcohol in her system, it wasn't enough to incapacitate her. Most of the drug was still in her stomach, undigested. She showed only a small abrasion over her eye, not enough to knock her out or kill her. Her cause of death was undetermined. The circumstances were not suspicious enough to launch an investigation. However, in hindsight, one detail stood out. After Sandra was taken away, a neighbor walked in to find Amos burning something in the fireplace. He told the neighbor it was his wife's clothes, bloodied from her accident. But whatever killed Sandra left no bleeding cuts or lacerations. There was no blood at the scene, and she was taken away in the clothes she was wearing when she died. So the question became for us, what was Ed burning in the fireplace? And why was it so important that he get it destroyed before anyone saw exactly what it was? Lowell Edward Amos received $350,000 as beneficiary of his first wife's insurance. Shortly after came wife number two, Carolyn Amos, Lowell's mistress while he was married to Sandra. You are irresponsible, no. Their marriage was rocky. The friction point was the huge insurance policies Lowell kept taking out on his new wife. When he would not drop these policies in 1988, Carolyn threw him out of the house. He went to live with his mother, Mary Tolles, age 76. He stayed with her approximately two weeks when she became ill and was brought to the emergency room. 
Her doctor commented that it appeared as though she was drugged, but none of the medications prescribed to her could account for her disorientation. At the hospital, she began to recover and was sent home. Carol and Amos phoned Mary Tolles every day to check up on her. A few weeks after Tolles returned from the hospital, Carolyn's call was answered by Lowell, who had just discovered that his mother was dead, apparently for several hours. Carolyn raced over to the house with a friend to find Lowell packing his belongings into his car. He didn't want anyone to know he was living there. Lowell inherited more than a million dollars from his mother's estate. No autopsy was performed on Mary Tolles because of her age. Carolyn let Lowell move back into the house. Nine months later, in the spring of 1989, Carolyn, too, was dead. According to Lowell's report to police, he brought Carolyn a glass of wine while she was in the bathroom blow-drying her hair. check on her later, he found her dead on the bathroom floor, eerily like his first wife. It took a while for medical assistance to arrive at their secluded house. By then, it was too late to revive her. Amos suggested that she may have been electrocuted from the blow dryer. An examination of the cord showed that it had been cut, but Carolyn wasn't electrocuted. Her cause of death was never determined. Though the case was never pursued, the medical crew found inconsistencies at the scene. The wine glass was missing, found later rinsed and in the dishwasher, and the position of the victim's body suggested that she had been moved. Her pajama top and her pajama pants were up at the ends, both at the bottoms of her feet as well as at her waist, hitched up as it were, as if she had been moved. Certainly not in a position they would have been if she had crumpled to the floor. Lowell received $800,000 from his second wife's insurance policies. For investigators, Lowell Amos was the kiss of death to the women he purportedly loved. Detective Hennahan believed it had to be more than coincidence. I have had three close relatives of mine that have died. Uh, I've never been within 500 miles of any one of them when they died. Lowell Amos was in the company of all four of these persons when they died. Um, he benefited uh, emotionally and financially from their deaths. Like the other deaths, Roberta Amos lay dead for some time before authorities were notified. Ed wanted to make sure that each of these women was beyond help. He wanted to make sure none could be resuscitated, none could be medically brought back to life, because he wanted all of these women dead. Though Roberta Amos's marriage was failing, she enjoyed a measure of professional success. Shortly before her death, she had purchased a house with her own money. Her plan was to legally end her marriage to Lowell and make a fresh start. Though Lowell Edward Amos had no financial stake in her death, investigators believed that he couldn't stand the idea that she had rejected him. The similarities between the death of Roberta Amos and Lowell's other wives was enough to expose him as an opportunistic serial killer who murdered for money or just to end an inconvenient marriage. Based on the collected evidence and the ghosts from his past, authorities had what they needed to arrest him for the murder of his third wife, Roberta Amos. From the photographs of that night, Roberta Maury Amos looked happy. 
She looked like she was having a good time. She must have had hope for the future then. She shouldn't have. At trial, the prosecution presented an account of the last night of Roberta Amos's life. After leaving Norbert Crabtree's suite, the couple went to their own room where Lowell dissolved a large quantity of cocaine in water. He was somehow able to incapacitate the victim. Once she was subdued, he used a syringe to administer the lethal dose of cocaine. Then, perhaps as she was convulsing, he smothered her with a pillow. He then scrubbed the body and cleaned up the crime scene as best he could before calling Crabtree to dispose of the remaining evidence. For his crime, Lowell Edward Amos was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Lowell Amos escaped suspicion through the subtlety of his crimes. But his past and forensics caught up with him at last. Other killers are more obvious in their methods, though they may be just as difficult to catch. Monday, March 24th, 1986, started out like any other Monday. By 8.30 a.m., the employees at the Transamerica Title Insurance Company in Tempe, Arizona, were already at the office. Their weekends a fading memory. Like her co-workers, 46-year-old Julianne Williams eased into the day with a trip to the break room. The coffee was on, but she preferred a drink of cool water. Just one sip told her something wasn't right. She immediately didn't feel well and headed to the ladies' room. She didn't know it, but she was beyond help. When Julie Williams was found in the ladies' room shortly before 9 a.m., she was in cardiac arrest. By the time paramedics arrived, she had slipped into a coma. They rushed her to the hospital. Something was in the water. While the co-workers discussed what had happened, one of them, Diane Harry, was on the phone to her husband. She was more concerned than the rest because something similar happened to her just a few days before. By the time police arrived to investigate, Diane Harry's husband, Lewis Harry, was already there, looking for what might have poisoned the water. Okay, fine. You take care, okay. But it wasn't just the cooler that was tainted. Tempe Police Sergeant Mike Palmer led the investigation. I detected an odor within the room. Upon examining uh, almost every cup, or container of any type and the coffee pot that was in there, I could see that there was some type of substance in almost all of them. At that point, we decided that uh, someone had purposely placed whatever this material was in these uh, containers in order to injure people. The office workers were lucky that no one else was hurt. But Julie Williams, after lingering in a coma, was not so fortunate. Whoever spread poison in the break room was now a murderer. Samples of the unknown poison were taken for identification. Police dusted for fingerprints, but no suspicious ones turned up. The police interviewed the office workers. Diane Harry told detectives that on the previous Friday, she became ill after taking a sip of scotch at home. That Saturday, a cup of tea affected her the same way. 
Uh, she remained uh, ill the entire weekend. She uh, barely could get out of bed. Uh, and she told me that the smell uh, uh, of the substance that she had inside her house in Phoenix was pretty much the same as the smell that was in the uh, substance that was in the break room. Questions as far as what happened with her she was concerned that she was the poisoner's target, which is why she called her husband to the office when Julianne Williams became ill. Police talked to Lewis Harry. He too was worried that someone was trying to poison Diane Harry. He said he'd been receiving threatening letters from the abusive boyfriend of a woman he'd helped. Perhaps this was his revenge. Lewis was sent home to collect the letters, along with the scotch bottle and tea kettle, so they could be analyzed. Meantime, police collected the security cards that every employee needed to enter the building. Investigators suspected that whoever planted the poison did it sometime during the weekend. A check with the security company showed that only one security card had been used that weekend at 10.18 on Saturday morning. It belonged to Diane Harry. When I confronted Mrs. Harry about her card being uh, the only one used during the weekend, uh, she denied having used it. Uh, the only thing she could tell me was that uh, she did not know where it was at other than the fact it should have been in her purse because that's where she'd placed it uh, the last time she'd used it. Mr. Harry, I just have a couple of questions. The card was in fact in her purse Monday morning when she went to work. She insisted she'd been bedridden all weekend and never left the house. It says that you checked into the so far, all the evidence pointed to Diane Harry, but was she the prime suspect or the intended victim? It was too soon to tell. While detectives were trying to identify the criminal, scientists were trying to name their poison. Samples from the office water cooler, coffee creamer and sugar bowl along with the tea kettle and scotch bottle from the Harry's house, were brought to the Arizona Department of Public Safety Crime Lab, where they were analyzed by Supervisor Jim Timmons. He knew that the poison was a fast-acting white powder. That helped him narrow down his tests. I really came up with a pretty short list of poisons that could have resulted in the information that uh, I had heard about the case. And uh, the short list was arsenic, uh, strychnine, or cyanide. Investigators applied a series of tests to the compound to narrow the list even further and to check and double check his results. An ultraviolet light was shown through a solution of the unknown substance and measured on an apparatus called a spectrophotometer. Strychnine, which absorbs UV light, would give a reading arsenic and cyanide, which reflect UV, wouldn't register. The unknown substance gave a reading on the spectrophotometer, proving it wasn't strychnine. They then performed a test for arsenic. Samples of the substance were dissolved in acid and a copper wire was placed in the resulting solution. If arsenic were present, it would attach to the wire and turn it black. No arsenic was present. The unknown poison in the office and in the Harry's home was most likely cyanide. To be certain, Timmons used a commercial kit for identifying cyanide. It's actually a very simple test but it involves some pretty complex chemical reactions. Ultimately what happens is a red dye is formed if you have cyanide and you test this on a paper strip that you drop into a solution. And in this case it was positive indicating cyanide was present. To remove all shadow of doubt, Timmons further confirmed his results with a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. The substance was sealed in a test tube of acid. If it was truly cyanide, it would form hydrogen cyanide gas, like a mini gas chamber. The gas was drawn off and injected into the apparatus, 
which confirmed that the cyanide gas was created. The battery of tests would provide essential forensic evidence for the courtroom if the poisoner was ever brought to trial. Timmons was not done yet. Cyanide most commonly appears in two forms, sodium cyanide and potassium cyanide. Both are equally lethal. A technique called energy dispersive x-ray analysis allowed him to simultaneously check for various elements in the compound. He found potassium. Samples from the office and from the Harry's home gave identical results. Both were potassium cyanide. The water cooler alone had enough cyanide to kill 150 people. The killer had set his or her traps in both places and cast a wide net to catch one victim. Diane Harry was either lucky to be alive or trying to disguise her role as the poisoner. The questioning continued. I questioned Miss Harry about her husband's ability to get her uh, electronic card that allowed access to the building and she stated that he could have but as far as she knew it was in her purse. Uh, she indicated to me that uh, she was not sure where he had been on that Saturday morning from approximately 9 in the morning until 12.30. If Diane truly didn't use her security card on Saturday, perhaps her husband did. He was the only other person who would have had access to it. He said he was running errands that day. He couldn't account for his exact whereabouts at the time the card was used to enter the building. He insisted that the killer was the jealous boyfriend of the woman whom he had helped. He had the threatening letters to prove it. While the documents were being examined, investigators looked further into Lewis Harry's movements. Their quest took them to a convenience store across the street from his wife's office building. Uh, we were able to find an individual who actually observed a black male subject driving a blue sports car, which is what Mr. Uh, Harry drove, uh, enter at the approximate time that his wife, Diane Harry's, uh, key card was used to open the, the door to the business. That gave investigators the leverage they needed to serve a search warrant on Lewis Harry's office. He worked in the athletics department of a community college. In the wastebasket, detectives found a label from a chemical supplier, some white powder on a bookshelf, and a small plastic knife, also speckled with powder that was later identified as cyanide. The cyanide found in his office didn't prove he put it there. A defense lawyer could argue that whoever tried to poison his wife also left cyanide at Lewis's office. But the next discovery would be much more difficult to explain away. Also, there was a legal pad that, was, that we found that had uh, the handwritten version of the threatening letters that had been mailed to him, the last few of the threatening letters. The pad and a box of envelopes were brought to the Department of Public Safety, where they were analyzed by forensic document examiner Bill Flynn. In many ways, handwriting is even more individualistic or individualizing than DNA for this reason. Um, there are groups of people in society like monozygotal twins or identical twins who do in fact have identical DNA characteristics. However, in forensic handwriting identification, we've never found any two people that have exactly identical handwriting characteristics. The handwriting on the letters was compared to samples of Lewis Harry's writing taken from business forms at his office and at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Flynn was able to say that Harry had actually written the drafts of the two threatening letters he claimed were sent to him. After he perfected his wording longhand, he typed the letters and mailed them. An analysis of the envelopes proved it. 
the letters that Harry presented to police were sent in slightly defective envelopes. The unused envelopes in the box confiscated at Harry's office bore similar flaws. Flynn exploited that weakness to strengthen his case. A defect of the type that we had seen in, the, uh, in that envelope was actually rare. The reason it was rare is that it would be severe enough to shut down the line. They would actually have to clear the envelope making line and restart it in order to, to clear that type of error. For Lewis Harry, the defective envelopes were especially incriminating. But they didn't seal his fate. Forensics had proved only that he'd sent himself the threatening letters. Now it had to prove he'd carried out his poisoned promises. To tie Lewis Harry to the poisoning of his wife's office, detectives needed to prove that he'd purchased the cyanide. They went to the chemical company listed on the label found in his office and obtained their sales records. The clerk recalled selling potassium cyanide to an African-American male. On the receipt, the name was Charles Holly. An African-American man named Charles Holly was contacted. He told police he'd never purchased cyanide. His signature wasn't close to the one on the receipt. Lewis Harry was asked to give a handwriting sample. We asked uh, Lewis Harry to write the name Charles Holly. He did do that. And from the earlier writings that uh, I had in my office, and now with the new exemplars, I was able to identify Lewis Harry as actually writing the name. That was all detectives needed to make their case against Lewis Harry. According to the prosecution scenario, Lewis Harry did receive threatening letters from the ex-boyfriend of the woman who was secretly Harry's new lover. The letters gave Harry the idea to write his own more threatening letters and send them to himself, implicating the ex-boyfriend. He practiced his poison pen letters before typing them. When his attempts to poison Diane Harry at home didn't work, he secretly borrowed her security card, sneaked into her office, and poisoned everything he could find in the break room. He was a frequent visitor to his wife's office, so his fingerprints weren't suspicious. But when his wife called him after Julianne Williams was poisoned, he wasted no time coming to the office to leave even more prints while pretending to show concern. Diane Harry's trust in her husband was steadfast to the end. Throughout the investigation, she refused to believe that he could be the poisoner. Though she remained unconvinced by the evidence, the jury saw it another way. For the murder of Julianne Williams, Lewis Harry was sentenced to life in prison for first degree murder, plus 105 more years for attempted murder. He's serving at least 95 years. Even after Lewis Harry's conviction, Diane Harry swore that he was a victim of circumstance. Her feelings changed a year later when her brother uncovered the box of cyanide hidden in the Harry's attic. For every criminal who thinks he's committed the perfect murder, there's a team of dedicated investigators out to prove him wrong. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, on the morning of March 28, 1990, six-year-old James Woodward called his dad because he couldn't find his mother. The Woodwards had been separated for three months. David Woodward told his son to go to the neighbor for help. Sure. 
The boy told the neighbor that he thought his mother was locked in the bathroom, but he couldn't hear any sounds inside. She followed James to the bathroom. He's in here, he's in here. Go call 911, quick. She quick. jimmied the lock and found 30-year-old Deborah Woodward submerged in the tub. An odor like solvent hung in the air. The paramedics and deputy medical examiner arrived to study the scene. The victim showed no contusions or abrasions to suggest that she slipped in the tub. There was nothing to indicate why she may have drowned. And there was no explaining the odor permeating the room. According to forensic pathologist Sparks Vesey, the situation was peculiar from the start. A normal, healthy adult generally does not just drown in four, five, six inches of, uh, of water in a, in a bathtub. Uh, we look for some explanation for that. At autopsy, blood was drawn and screened for alcohol, which might have contributed to the drowning. While a body is wet, injuries may be obscured, but as it dries, more is disclosed. As the examination continued, a chilling revelation sprang from the victim's own lips. The examination of the inside of the lips showed uh, injuries inside the lips, which were suggestive that something had been forcefully placed over the decedent's mouth and pressed into the teeth, ca causing injuries of the inside of the lips. The case was looking more like homicide by the minute. The blood work showed no alcohol in the victim's system, but it did reveal a volatile substance similar to acetone, or nail polish remover. A sample of the blood was placed in a gas chromatograph to better identify the substance. It turned out to be ether. In fact, every tissue in the victim's body was saturated with it. Ether is a volatile liquid that can depress the central nervous system. Depending on how much is inhaled, it can cause dizziness, unconsciousness, or death by respiratory failure. It was once a common form of medical anesthesia, but was replaced by more predictable and safer methods. Ether can be produced in the body by the breakdown of some other chemicals or drugs the victim might have taken. Chief toxicologist Ronald Backer didn't believe this was the case. But the fact that it was distributed in all tissues and in very high concentrations was a good indication that this was a significant substance that was not an artifact that really was involved in rendering her unconscious. The victim had enough ether in her system to knock her out, but it was the drowning that did her in. This was no accident. While investigating the suspicious death of Deborah Woodward, police learned that she was separated from her husband, David. Even so, she shared her house with him until it could be sold. In an unconventional timeshare arrangement, their three sons stayed at the house while Deborah and David took turns living there and sharing child custody. The plan was designed to create some stability for the boys, but the friction between the couple lay just below the surface. Deborah had a restraining order preventing her husband from approaching the house while it was her turn to live there. None of the couple's problems escaped the scrutiny of Albuquerque police detective Damon Fay, who was investigating Deborah Woodward's murder. So now I had to explore every part of her life, and I had to just open up all of the canisters of her life. One of them was her diary, particularly ghoulish to read, because I could see the buildup of heading towards marriage with David, uh, all of her excitement that goes along with that, the new marriage, the early years of it, then the deterioration of it. In her diaries, which Deborah entrusted to a friend for safekeeping. She recounted the physical and emotional abuse that she endured. 
Dave slapped me around in the bathroom, messed up my clothes, broke things. So much anger. Hell, absolute hell. After the separation, Deborah tried to get on with her life. She began dating and was starting a serious relationship. But her husband was jealous and she was fearful of what he might do. According to investigator Fay, she counted on her neighbor, a retired police sergeant, to keep an eye out for her, especially at night. And had actually come to the rescue of Deborah on several occasions where she felt David had been skulking around, or she heard bumps in the night and wanted him to sort of uh, investigate it. He would walk across the street and take care of things, walk around her house on occasion. So he had sort of passing knowledge about the domestic uh, turbulence. The neighbor told police that six months earlier, Deborah had noticed something odd in her car. He offered to take a look and discovered that David, an electronics expert at a garage, had planted a tape recorder in her car that switched on whenever the engine started. He'd also bugged the house and telephone lines. There was nowhere in the house where she couldn't go that he could overhear whatever conversation was taking place. He could then take these tapes away and dissect them, go back through them, listen to them, and that would just infuriate him. David was doing everything in his power to keep tabs on his wife, while Deborah devoted all her strength to making a clean break. It was a rough game of tug of war, and it looked like something had finally snapped. The neighbor told police that several days before the murder, he saw David Woodward dismantling the motion sensor spotlights he'd recently installed around the perimeter of the house. He thought nothing of it at the time. Now, it seemed too convenient. Woodward had the motive and opportunity to kill his wife, but where was the weapon? Though ether was obviously used to incapacitate the victim, it was the impurities in it that drew the focus of investigators. The killer had used impure industrial grade ether, like the kind used in carburetor starting fluid. Considering that David worked in a garage, that seemed a likely source. If they could link him to a brand of starting fluid with the same contaminants in it, they'd be that much closer to closing the case. They tested every can they could find with no matches. Hey man, I was the show the other night. As yeah. investigators were busy tracking down the ether, one of Woodward's co-workers contacted police. Oh man, there's so many he ways. He told them that a year earlier, never, Woodward had talked know. about getting away with murder by using a volatile substance like ether. Woodward claimed it would be untraceable. He was very detailed about it, the but the co-worker wasn't paying close attention. Based on this lead and the other circumstantial evidence gathered at this point, police obtained a warrant to search the garage. How long did you stay there? They confiscated an assortment of chemicals, including more cans of carburetor starting fluid. We never did find any brand uh, that was perfect, but we found some that were very close and ones that we, we, we could put a uh, star next to as the possible source of the, uh, of the ether in the Deborah Woodward uh, blood sample. But in terms of evidence, it was enough. David Woodward was arrested. Based on the evidence, police reconstructed the murder of Deborah Woodward. It was the victim's habit to take a late night soak after putting the children to sleep. While she was getting ready for her bath, David used his key to enter the house. 
He had already dismantled the motion sensors so he could sneak into the yard under cover of darkness. Once in the house, he saturated a rag with starting fluid, overpowered his wife, and caused the marks seen at autopsy. As the victim lay unconscious, David pushed her head below the water. He thought the ether would evaporate, and with it would go all evidence of a crime. The truth of the matter is that dead men tell plenty of tales if you have a competent team of forensic investigators, which include the police at the scene, the uh, autopsy people taking the samples, and the laboratory that analyzes the samples. David Woodward received life in prison for murder and an additional nine years for aggravated burglary for entering the home and battering his wife. No poison is perfect. The clearest liquid or finest powder still leaves behind its residue. And though the victim may at first appear unmarked, science can reveal how death was dispensed and dispense justice to the poisoner. The hunt is on for a serial killer who's preying on young men. Investigators have a plan to catch him, but will he take the bait? At first, it looked like a bungled burglary, but Maryland detectives could see the motive was murder. To solve it, they must establish which clues are real. Industrial parks in western Florida have become a killer's dumping ground. How many more women will die before authorities put him out of business? For some people, killing might come easy, but getting away with it seldom is. No matter how a murderer tries to cover his crimes, there will always be something left at the scene. Charlotte County, Florida, April 17, 1996. Two county road inspectors took a break from their duties to set up hog traps along a popular but secluded hunting trail. Bam. What they found were the remains of someone else's prey. Any what we're looking for? A human skull. They notified the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office. It was up to the forensics team to gather together what time and animals had scattered through the woods. Besides more remains, they looked for clothing, a weapon, or anything else that might help them determine the identity of the victim and how he or she came to be there. All investigators found was a single pink fiber near the skull. But it paled in comparison to what was discovered next. 50 yards from where the skull was found, an investigator spotted a roll of carpet padding. Inside was a male body, but it wasn't the body he expected to find. This one had a head. He was a second victim, more recent than the first, probably killed within the last few days. Less compromised by the elements, this second victim provided a second opportunity for usable clues. Rope fibers clung to a nearby tree, and additional lengths of rope were found strewn in the woods. A single tiny paint chip was lifted off the body. 
According to Jim Myers of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, these murder scenarios are the hardest kind of cases to solve. It's not like a traditional crime where, you know, you're in a house or whatever and you've got credit cards, you can find out who that is, you know, do associates, neighborhood checks and that type of thing. It doesn't work that way when you just get a body out in the woods. A few feet from the first victim's skull, investigators found what remained of his torso. Though the body was badly decomposed, they were able to discern an unusual tattoo on his shoulder. It was their only hope of identifying him. Authorities relied on the media for help. That night, the news broadcast the photo of the tattoo, hoping someone might recognize it and identify the victim. Someone did. A woman phoned the police and said it looked like the tattoo worn by her brother, 25-year-old Kenny Smith. She told authorities that she hadn't heard from him in some time. Though he lived much of the time on the street, he'd recently seen the dentist, who provided up-to-date dental records. From them, investigators confirmed the remains found in the woods were Kenny Smith's. Yes. Investigators still had the other victim found in the carpet padding to identify. At autopsy, the body was determined to be a white male in his 20s. No one had reported anyone matching his description as missing in the county. The body was vacuumed to collect stray fibers and other trace evidence that might be clinging to it. Then the body was examined. Ligature marks scarred it in several places, mostly around his neck and genital region. He had been strangled to death by rope. Afterward, the killer had removed his genitals with a scalpel or sharp knife. Clearly the act of a twisted yet methodical mind. The victim had been dead approximately one day and his fingerprints were still readable. From them, he was determined to be 21-year-old Richard Montgomery. All right, looks good. <clears throat> Montgomery and Smith were not the first young white males found dead in the woods of southwest Florida. Yo! Rick, looks like we've got something over here. Okay, hold on. Between 1994 and 1996, three others had been found in the woods of Charlotte and Sarasota counties. Fearing they were dealing with a serial killer, Chief Investigator Rick Hobbs called in a criminal profiler. He reviewed the evidence that we had and basically confirmed that he, in his opinion, he felt that the same person was responsible for all these uh, murders. And uh, he described uh, the person as possibly a sexual sadist. Someone was preying on male drifters. And like some of his victims, he had no name. Because his latest victims were found on the hog hunting trail, the press called him the Hog Trail Killer. To coordinate efforts across jurisdictions, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement formed a task force with the Charlotte County Sheriff's Department and the Northport Police. Special Agent Jim Myers led the task force. They hadn't a minute to waste. We're talking with a person that basically is going to keep killing unless we stop them, and that's the primary reason to get a task force. We have the situation we had, we had to get as many people as we could involved to prevent it from happening again. You know, our primary mission is to get the bad guy, but what we also have to do is protect the public safety. The mysterious serial killings received wide publicity. Soon, it paid off. Donald Perry, an inmate at a state prison in Florida, had seen a news report and told authorities he might have been a potential victim of the killer. Perry said that a man approached him in a park 
and offered him $150 to pose nude in the woods. He said the pictures would involve bondage, that he'd be tied to a tree. They'd be Polaroids, so he wouldn't have to worry about the negatives being sold. The man, whose name was Dan, seemed very gentle, and Perry needed the money, so he took the job. On the way to the woods, the car got stuck in the mud on a secluded road. Some passers-by helped them free it while Perry steered. All right, come on. That was when Perry noticed the kit Dan had prepared for the photo shoot. The ropes, knife, and gloves made him fear for his life. As soon as the car was freed, Perry hit the gas. Glasses was the guy I saw on TV. A few hours later, he was arrested for stealing it. The scenario fit the profile closely enough for investigators to check the theft report. Investigators learned the theft report was filed by a man named Daniel Conahan and his father, who owned the vehicle. The task force took the lead and ran with it. They set up surveillance on Conahan. The 43-year-old registered nurse lived with his parents in Charlotte County. His nursing training recalled the clinical precision the killer used to mutilate one of the victims. Police photographed Conahan talking to and following drifters in his car. That was no crime. However, it was suspicious. And for the task force, an opportunity. They sent an undercover officer to pose as a decoy. They met several times as the decoy built Conahan's trust. The detective wore a body wire to record their conversations. Conahan eventually asked the detective to pose for pictures in the woods. Hoping Conahan would open up and say more, the undercover detective asked him to his camp in the woods, which was already staked out by a SWAT team. The detective had his agenda to gather evidence. But Conahan didn't cooperate. As the detective continued asking questions, Conahan lost interest. Investigators came away with only circumstantial evidence and nothing to warrant an arrest. If Daniel Conahan was a sadistic serial killer, he remained free to stalk new prey. Last week on the 16th. Police in Florida were on the trail of Daniel Conahan, suspected serial killer. But they had no real evidence. In June, two months after the last two murders were discovered, a Fort Myers police officer recalled a case from three years earlier. It was similar to an incident recently reported by an inmate named Donald Perry. Once again, it was a prisoner who held the key. Stanley Burden, serving time in Ohio, had a story to tell. It had a familiar ring. He said that he'd met a man outside a hamburger joint in Fort Myers who offered him money to be tied up in the woods and photographed. He said the guy's name was Dan. Needing the cash, Burden consented. Dan asked him to remove some clothes and then began tying him to a tree with clothesline he cut with a pair of pliers. The situation quickly spun out of control. Once Burden was immobilized, Dan began tightening the ropes around his neck. When they were sufficiently tight, Dan left him and never returned. Burden eventually freed himself. 
he was able to describe Dan's car. And more importantly, he picked Dan Conahan's picture out of a photo lineup. Based on this, investigators were able to arrest Conahan for the assault and attempted murder of Stanley Burden. Basically a great relief for us at the task force because we was able to get him off the street earlier uh, by the crime that he committed on Burton and, and uh, be able to proceed in putting our cases together on the murders. Investigators were a long way from proving Conahan was the serial killer they were looking for. That required more tangible proof. They obtained a warrant to search the home he shared with his parents. Forensic examiners collected fibers from carpets, bedding, and furniture. Each specimen was carefully tagged, packaged, and sent off to the crime lab for analysis. Conahan's automobile was searched as well. Besides an assortment of carpet and upholstery fibers, technicians also collected a chip of paint from the car's peeling exterior. They needed to compare it to the one found on the body of Richard Montgomery, one of the two young men found along the hog trail. Hoping to find more incriminating evidence against their suspect, investigators subpoenaed Conahan's credit card records for the previous three years. To investigators, items listed on the statements suggested Conahan was stocking and restocking a murder kit. On the 16th of April, we found where just before Miss Montgomery disappeared, some of the items, pliers, rope, knife, and I believe a tarp was purchased that afternoon. The items were purchased at a store just down the street from where Richard Montgomery lived. While the credit card records were being scrutinized, the fiber and paint samples were analyzed at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement lab. Several fibers collected from Conahan's house matched fibers gathered at the crime scene. Next, the paint chip from Conahan's car was analyzed to see if it matched the chip found clinging to one of the victims. A tiny chip of paint can hold volumes of information. First, it's looked at to determine how many layers of paint are present, their colors, and their thickness. Both the sample from the car and the specimen from the murder scene consisted of four layers of paint of matching colors and thickness. Microanalyst Jan Taylor needed to determine if the two chips chemically matched. In doing my microchemical examinations, I take small peels of each layer within the paint sample and apply a solvent or reagent to it to see how the paint reacts to the solvent or reagent. And I perform this on the question paint recovered from the victim as well as the known paint samples removed from the vehicle. And in doing so, I did determine that these paints indeed were like one another at this step of my examination. And that brought detectives one step closer to making their case against Conahan. But still not close enough. Taylor had more work to do. She used infrared radiation to analyze the chemical binders in the paint samples. Then a scanning electron microscope revealed the pigments. In a process called energy dispersive x-ray analysis, the samples are bombarded with x-rays causing them to throw off electrons. These electrons reveal the elements that the paint pigments are made from. In all these tests, the paint chips matched. The conclusion that I reached following these tests were that the question paint chip removed from the victim originated from this vehicle the paint chip found on Richard Montgomery's body had come from Daniel Conahan's car. Science had made its case against Conahan. According to the evidence, Conahan lured Richard Montgomery into the woods for a bogus photo shoot. 
once he had Montgomery where he wanted him, Conahan tortured and killed him. The jury deliberated only around 20 minutes before sentencing the hog trail killer to death. Daniel Conahan sought out his victims and lured them to their deaths. Other killers are less meticulous. They strike closer to home and kill on the spot. 70 miles from Baltimore, Hagerstown, Maryland is a typical American community and a good place to raise kids. A place where some folks don't feel the need to lock their doors, at least most of the time. On Valentine's Day, 1995, Deborah and Tim Massey's twin sons came home from school and found themselves locked out. That was unusual. Deborah was always home to greet her eight-year-olds. They went to the garage behind their house where their father, hey, Tim hey. Massey, ran a towing company. Their dad wasn't around, so they asked an employee, Daryl Mosier, if he'd seen their mother. He took the boys back to the house and tried knocking. He got no response. Deborah. The broken window caused him some concern. Hey, let's go on over to Grandma's house. Tim Massey was out on a job, so Mosier brought the boys to their grandmother, who lived nearby. She called Deborah's house. Still, no answer. Sensing that something had to be wrong, Daryl Mosier returned to the house and entered. And there he found Deborah Massey collapsed on the living room floor. She wasn't breathing. He phoned the police. Hagerstown City Police. He reported that someone appeared to have broken in, but the doors were still locked. Detective George Brandt of the Hagerstown Police questioned that scenario. We were advised that all the doors were locked, both the front door and the back door of the residence. And we thought that was odd. I mean, somebody would go ahead and, and, and murder someone and leave the residence and lock in the doors. Deborah Massey always left the doors open so that her kids could get in when they came home from school. The locked doors were just the first of several strange clues investigators found. The next clue was attached to the television, where forensic scientist Jeff Kirchival found a strange note. It said, your husband is next, I need money. Now, here we have someone writing a note to a dead person, a person that they had just killed. It would make more sense if they were writing the note to the husband to say, you are next, uh, and give their name. For example, Tim, Tim, you are next, I need money. But whoever scribbled this bizarre note to a dead woman apparently didn't need money that badly after all. He'd ransacked the house, but left behind the victim's jewelry and even some cash. This bungled burglary was looking more like a sloppy murder in disguise. Maryland investigators on the scene of a murder initially believed the motive was robbery. But on closer inspection, it seemed nothing of value had been taken. Along with fiber samples, they picked up shards of glass from the broken window. A cigarette butt was collected from a trash can. Mrs. Massey was not a smoker. The house had no ashtrays, lighters, matches, or cigarettes. Investigators believed that the killer must have left this cigarette butt behind. Deborah Massey, who had recently filed for divorce from her husband, Tim, lived in the house with her twins. By all accounts, she was a devoted mom who stayed active in her children's lives. Though Tim Massey had moved to an apartment, he still operated the towing service out of the backyard of the house. While the crime scene was being investigated, detectives reviewed Daryl Mosier's statement. 
Mosier claimed that Tim Massey arrived for work at around 10.30 a.m., stayed about 10 minutes, then left. Around 11.45, Massey returned. Mosier saw him walking towards the house. Mosier said that Massey returned a few minutes later. They spoke briefly, and then Massey left again. Mosier left for lunch shortly thereafter. Mosier said he didn't see Deborah at all. An examination of the property demonstrated that the only way to get to the back door was to pass by the garage. Mosier said he saw nobody pass there except for Tim Massey. But Massey never stayed for any length of time. A check of Mosier's statement established his whereabouts for the entire day and dismissed him as a suspect. So whatever happened at the Massey house happened while Mosier was away for lunch. At the killer's point of entry, investigators found a toolbox. Inside was a hammer with glass particles clinging to it, probably used to break the window. As the investigation at the house continued, Tim Massey arrived. He said his mother contacted him when Daryl Mosier brought the kids over and said that the house had been broken into. Police informed him of his wife's murder and took him to the station for questioning. As a husband going through a bitter divorce, Tim Massey was automatically a suspect, especially since he was seen at the house that morning. He cooperated fully with police. He handed over the contents of his pockets, which included ink pens. He gave them his clothes for forensic analysis. It was standard procedure for proving someone's innocence. Tim Massey acknowledged that the couple had a rocky relationship. Deborah had filed for divorce two weeks earlier and had also filed a protective order against Tim. He and his employees were not allowed in the home. Uh, seven o'clock. What time did you go to Bob's? Seven. Massey stated that he'd been at the garage once that morning. He went to check on one of the twins who'd been sick. The information helped Detective George Brent piece together Massey's whereabouts that morning. So he actually was interested in the one boy, seeing how he was doing. And of course he learned when he got there, and this uh, was between 10 and 10.30 that morning, that uh, his boy had gone to school and he was doing all right. So Mr. Massey, can you tell me where you he were? He told police that Deborah had met him on the porch. What time did you get there? Massey insisted he hadn't been inside the house in weeks. After leaving the house, he went to one of the police impound lots that he towed vehicles to. Around 1 o'clock, Massey called the police to report that someone had stolen the wheels off one of the cars he was storing for the police. The officer met him at the lot at 1.18. They were there until 1.50 when they both went to the police station. Massey was friendly with the police because he did some towing work for them. He said he wanted to go to the station to say hello. And I imagine he was in here for a good half hour, maybe a little later, longer, uh, just talking to people down there on the first floor. We already interviewed Investigators had to consider that Deborah Massey was killed randomly by a stranger. According to Detective Bill Rourke, Investigators hit the streets to see if anyone could report anything suspicious. We did neighborhood canvases. Uh, anyone who saw anything unusual was brought into police headquarters and a statement was obtained from them. Uh, all of Mr. Massey's employees uh, were brought into police headquarters and statements were obtained from them. Uh, we interviewed family members. Uh, we interviewed anyone at all who was willing to talk to us who had any information at all. Despite their efforts, police turned up nothing. Nobody had any useful information to share. No one had seen anything suspicious. While police canvassed neighborhoods, Deborah Massey underwent an autopsy. Examiners concluded that she was murdered sometime between 11.15 a.m. and 1.15 p.m. 
From the markings on her throat, it was clear that she was manually strangled to death. Forensic scientist Jeff Kerchival noticed something significant about the markings. I had investigated two other cases involving manual strangulation within the past six months. And in all those cases, there were tiny crescent-shaped abrasions over the surface of the neck and the face area where the individual had used their hands to strangle them. In this case, with Debbie Massey, none of those markings were present. And in the interview room with Mr. Massey, I noted that he was a nail biter and had very, very short fingernails. 11, 15, 11, Nail biting is not a punishable offense, and it certainly you? didn't prove Tim Massey was the killer. Okay. Mr. Massey, could you stand up and the Investigators look for every possible way to eliminate him as a suspect. But Tim Massey couldn't account for all of his movements during the time in which the murder had occurred. They felt there were too many unanswered questions regarding Tim Massey. They hoped to find answers at his apartment. Mr. Massey, could you have your clothes? Investigators believed that Tim Massey might know more about his wife's murder than he was letting on. He gave his consent to search his apartment. In the hamper, investigators recovered a pair of trousers. In the cuffs were small fragments of glass. This was the first piece of incriminating evidence against Tim Massey. When he had arrived at the house, officers kept him at a safe distance to prevent contamination of the crime scene. It was unlikely that he came in contact with the glass on the porch at that time. But for the fragments found on his pants to be true physical evidence, they needed to be tested. The fibers and the glass collected from the pants were compared against samples taken from the murder scene. They matched. The lab also tested the ink from the pens that Massey handed over during his interview. Whenever a manufacturer manufactures a new lot of ink, they send a representative sample to the Secret Service. At that particular point in time, they had somewhere in the neighborhood of about 7,000 different inks in their reference library. The ink on the note matched none of the database samples, suggesting that it was a generic brand. The odds of matching it to a specific pen grew even slimmer than 7,000 to one. And yet, one of Tim Massey's pens had exactly the same chemical characteristics as the ink on the note found at the scene. But the most indelible mark of Massey's guilt was the freshly smoked cigarette found at the crime scene. It was Tim Massey's brand, and more precisely, his DNA was on it that conclusively placed him at the scene and caught him in a blatant lie. Mr. Massey uh, continuously denied that he was in the house uh, during this day or for several weeks prior to that. Um, if he would have placed himself in the house, that would have not been strange to us due to the fact he would, used to be married to the lady, they were going through a divorce and he had two children that lived there, but he was adamant that he had not been in the house. Not only had Tim Massey been there that day, he also killed there. On September 20th, 1995, Tim Massey was arrested for the murder of his wife, Deborah. From what police could determine, Massey, who was seeing another woman, realized that if Deborah divorced him, she would be entitled to half of his assets, including the towing business he had built from scratch. It would mean selling the business and starting over. Massey had a different plan. Sometime between noon and 1 p.m., Massey entered his wife's house through the unlocked door and strangled her. Then he wrote the note and staged the robbery. He knew his kids would come home from school and he didn't want them to find their mother's body, so he locked the door on his way out. He broke the window to simulate a break-in. More locked doors awaited Timothy Massey, who was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. 
Tim Massey tried to disguise his crime through a series of false clues. Other killers spend their time trying to erase any trace evidence at the scene. But it's only a matter of time before the clues they leave behind catch up with them. Pinellas County is a small southern peninsula jutting out of Florida's western flank. It's home to the resort and fishing community of Clearwater. It was also the site of a series of grisly murders. On October 20th, 1995, a delivery person discovered the nude body of a woman outside an industrial park. Police arrived at the scene and began to gather clues. But few were found. The victim's clothing and jewelry were gone. And though marks on her wrists and ankles suggested she'd been tied up at some point, no rope was found. Bruises to her body indicated she'd been beaten, but there were no signs of sexual assault. Lack of footprints and broken vegetation suggested she was killed elsewhere and her body hidden here. The ground did hold a tire impression. Investigators had no guarantee that the killer's vehicle had made it, but the possibility couldn't be overlooked. Plaster was poured over the impression to make a cast for further analysis. At autopsy, the cause of death was determined to be strangulation. Animal hairs were recovered from the body. A few tiny synthetic fibers also were retrieved. None of this would be of any use unless a suspect surfaced. The victim's fingerprints were run through the police database. She was 42-year-old Wendy Ann Evans, who had a record for drugs. So how long has uh, your mother been missing? Evans had come to Clearwater to be with her daughter. When did she turn? She's had a bad life. The victim's daughter told investigators that her mother had been going through some hard times. Um, I would say approximately. The victim's father had just died. She'd been trying to kick her drug habit, and she believed her cancer was recurring. A few days before her death, she'd even checked herself into a psychiatric facility to cope with her depression. She wanted desperately to pull her life together. But her luck took a fatal turn for the worse. Three weeks later, at another industrial area, another new female body was found. Like Wendy Ann Evans, this victim had been bound and beaten, then left in a secluded spot. Again, there were no signs of sexual assault. The similarities between the two cases defied coincidence. Both were found in industrial areas within 10 miles of each other. The latest victim was identified by police records as 40-year-old Peggy Darnell, a prostitute from Clearwater. Sergeant Mike Ring worked the case. We had no physical evidence from that scene because of the decomposition of the body. We had no hairs, no fibers, no footprints, no tire tracks that were of any value to the investigation. Nevertheless, investigators suspected the same person was responsible for both murders. And these might not have been the killer's first victims. A check of police records revealed a third victim. Fifteen months earlier, a prostitute named LaDonna Steller was found murdered. Except for the span of time, the details were eerily familiar. All three women were white females. Uh, they'd all been uh, found nude, no jewelry or clothing on any of the bodies. And the cause of death, on at least on Stellar and Evans, was manual strangulation with some physical beating. The only crime scene to provide potential forensic evidence was the murder of Wendy Ann Evans. Detective Tom Klein of the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department tried to make the most of the scant clues. The tire track had been sent off to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for analysis. Uh, the fibers were being analyzed at FDLE. We were uh, consistently talking to the prostitutes in the area and trying to make contact with their Johns. So we were keeping very busy. And so was the killer. In January 1996, 
three months after Wendy Ann Evans was killed, the body of 27-year-old Cindy Pugh was discovered behind a dumpster. Its location was halfway between where the two other victims were found. And like them, she was nude and had been strangled. If any doubt about a serial killer remained, the murder of Cindy Pugh erased it. The sheets that authorities used to wrap the victims were sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab in Tampa Bay. There, they were carefully swept. Anything falling off of them was collected on a crimped sheet of butcher paper called a debris fold. Microanalyst Jerry Serino looked for trace evidence among the debris. When using a, a stereo microscope to actually sift through uh, the debris, it's a very time-consuming and slow process. It was time well spent. Among the debris collected from the Wendy Ann Evans murder, Serino found four pink carpet fibers. They matched the carpet fibers found on Cynthia Pugh. More animal hairs were also found. They were sent off for further analysis. Cynthia Pugh's body also had a tiny shred of cigarette filter paper clinging to it. The trace evidence proved that the women were the victims of the same killer, but it brought authorities no closer to finding who that killer was. He was free to keep on killing. Investigators formed a task force to alert potential victims and to monitor the area where the prostitutes worked. Meanwhile, in another department of the FDLE, senior analyst Oral Woods studied the tire tread lifted from the first murder scene. I was looking for a particular tire with a similar tread design. Once I found that similar tread design in my tire guidebook, uh, I was able then to determine it was a Firestone radial ATX tire. A check with the manufacturer revealed that the tire was made for light trucks, but few were sold. In fact, they'd stopped making it three years earlier. We asked them to, to pull up any inventory that would reflect sales of this particular size and style tire and they were able to show that there was only one set of four tires sold in the Tampa Bay metropolitan area in the previous three years. The manufacturer gave investigators the name of the dealer, who in turn told them who purchased the tires, someone named Terry Howard. Detectives began surveillance at Howard's home and discovered that she was a woman. Someone was killing women in Florida, and investigators' only clue was a tire tread. It brought them to the home of a woman named Terry Jo Howard. She owned a light truck, like the one they were looking for. But it was driven mainly by a man who lived with her. We didn't have him identified. We had no idea who he was. His name wasn't on any of the leases, wasn't on any of the telephone subscriptions or power subscriptions. He was put on separate surveillance and was eventually identified as a window installer named James Randall. Investigators' efforts were beginning to pay off. Once we had Randall identified, we started an in-depth background on him. We found out all about his uh, previous arrests in Massachusetts, the fact that there were outstanding warrants for him for uh, violating his parole, uh, the previous history of him being a suspect in a murder in Massachusetts. Randall certainly fit the mold for a murder suspect, and the surveillance revealed that the tires on his girlfriend's truck were the same type found at the murder scene. But investigators needed hard evidence. Then they got a break. During the surveillance, Randall pulled into a tire store and had two of the truck tires replaced. Police obtained the old ones from the dealer. But it wasn't enough. Their tire expert needed all four to make the comparison against the cast from the crime scene. Investigators came up with a plan. First, they purchased a new set of tires to switch with the ones on Randall's truck. We then 
had the uh, manager at the tire store contact Terry Jo Howard and uh, told her that uh, the two tires that he put on her truck were defective and if she took the time to bring her truck in he would give her four brand new tires for free. She couldn't come quick enough. She came in, uh, she exchanged the tires and uh, now we had all four tires. The tire expert determined that one of the tires from Randall's truck was consistent with the impression left at Wendy Ann Evans' murder scene. Not only were the manufacturer's tread patterns the same, but more important, the nicks, abrasions, and wear patterns also matched. Like a fingerprint, these characteristics are unique to every tire. That proved that the truck was there, but it didn't necessarily mean that it was there at the time of the murder. Randall could have driven his truck there days or mere minutes before the crime occurred. Investigators needed proof. They needed physical evidence that directly linked him to the victims. But they still didn't have probable cause to get a search warrant for his house. The stray hairs on both Wendy Ann Evans and Cynthia Pugh's bodies were determined to be dog hair. Randall's girlfriend, Terry Jo Howard, owned a dog. Investigators needed a sample of its fur to make the comparison. But how? And we came up with the idea of using uh, this female sergeant and one of our other female detectives to pose as mo mobile dog groomers. They made up flyers to hand out and post around the neighborhood. They included a phone number and announced they'd be going door to door offering their grooming service. To make the ruse legal, the police had to offer the same service to everyone in the neighborhood. Fortunately, no one else took them up on their offer. They arrived at Terry Joe Howard's home while James Randall was at work. Terry Joe welcomed them in. We can take her right outside, right out front. Things went better than expected. There on the floor was a mauve rug the possible source of the fibers found on the two bodies. The officers washed the pet. They used sterile towels to dry it and collect samples of its fur. The analysis of the dog hairs indicated they matched the ones from the crime scenes. Now, detectives had the tires and the dog hair to tie James Randall to the slain. But prosecutors felt they still didn't have grounds for a warrant. It was time to pull out their ace in the hole. By living in Florida, Randall was violating his parole in Massachusetts. On June 26, 1996, eight months after the first murder, Pinellas County deputies went to arrest Randall so authorities could keep an eye on him while they built their homicide case. But it wasn't as simple as that. At the sight of the deputies, Randall sped off, racing through a neighborhood before abandoning his truck and fleeing on foot. He managed to scale a fence and vanish into a densely wooded area. Authorities mounted a massive search, but Randall eluded them. They were confident he'd try to make contact with his girlfriend. I if you had heard anything or seen anything. Um, I think I had read about... They went to Terry Jo Howard's house to gauge her knowledge of the crimes. It was the first time they'd contacted her directly. When the police informed her of Randall's criminal record, and told her that he was a suspect, she cooperated completely. Canvassing the area to see if there was anybody and so did her dog. About the brutal murders that occurred. One of the things that they noticed was that Terry Joe Howard's dog uh, was always hacking up and spitting. And when he'd hack up and spit, there would be these pieces of paper. And we found out later on that this dog liked to eat cigarette butts out of the ashtray. Investigators recalled that a tiny piece of cigarette filter paper was collected from the body of Cynthia Pugh. Terry told police that she was the smoker. She consented to give a blood sample so that her DNA could be compared to that found on the crime scene cigarette paper. 
She also allowed investigators to take her mauve rug to be analyzed. The rug was analyzed and found to contain several kinds of fibers. With the whole rug at his disposal, Jerry Serino was able to get a more complete forensic picture. He compared the rug to fibers taken from victims Pew and Evans. I was able to say that those fibers could have come from this particular rug. If they did not come from this particular rug, they came from a rug that had the exact same characteristics that had an opportunity to come in contact with both Cynthia Pugh and Wendy Evans. In the language of forensic fiber analysis, that's considered the closest thing to an exact match. But it was the DNA analysis that clinched the case. It linked the scrap of paper found on Cynthia Pugh to the cigarettes in the home of Terry Joe Howard and the suspect, James Randall. Randall, still on the lam, returned to the house four days after he fled. But when he saw detectives there, he took off again. This time, he didn't get away. Investigators believe that while Terry Joe Howard was out of town, he'd pick up prostitutes, bring them home, and kill them. But Randall was careful. Except for the scrap of cigarette paper, he left no DNA on his victims. He didn't need to. In April 1997, based on the forensic evidence, James Randall was convicted of second-degree murder for the killing of Wendy Ann Evans and Cynthia Pugh. He was given two life sentences. Some killers choose a remote venue. Others doctor the site to conceal their presence. And some take great pains to leave no trace of themselves behind. In the end, it doesn't matter. If the killer has been there, forensics can find something they've left at the scene. In North Carolina, a tragic car accident is blamed for the death of a 45-year-old woman. But a routine investigation raises more questions than answers. And police soon learn that things aren't always as they appear to be. A mother of six is found brutally murdered in her Florida home. The forensic evidence points detectives to a suspect but his whereabouts and the motive behind the murder remain a mystery. For some killers, murder can be a profitable business. And when a victim has been targeted for death, homicide investigators must look beyond the obvious to uncover a murder for hire. On the morning of August 23, 1995, a motorist summoned rescue workers and emergency personnel to a remote area off North Carolina's Blue Ridge Parkway. While pulled over at a scenic overlook, she had spotted a van that had plunged several hundred feet down the steep embankment. There was no movement in the vehicle. Transylvania County rescue workers made their way down the cliff, hopeful they would find survivors. When the rescue worker entered the vehicle, a 
piece of cinder block stained with blood fell out of the van. A woman laid slumped across the front seat. She had suffered massive head injuries. There was no pulse. The body was removed from the vehicle and sent to the morgue for examination. North Carolina State Police began looking for clues to tell them how and why the vehicle went off the road. No skid marks or any signs of sudden braking were found. And there were no indications that the driver had swerved off the road. It was likely that the woman had fallen asleep at the wheel or had been under the influence of drugs or alcohol. The van was brought up the embankment for a more detailed evaluation. A check on the vehicle's tags revealed that the van was registered to a man named Edward Kratzert, whose address was several hundred miles away in Bradenton, Florida. After finding no obvious mechanical problems with the van, technicians processed the vehicle. Reddish-brown stains were found on the exterior of the driver's side door. They tested positive for human blood. Inside, they recovered a wallet and driver's license. The driver was identified as 45-year-old Wendy Kratzert, the wife of the vehicle's owner. Blood was found throughout the van. The back of an earring was located on the passenger seat floor. Unsure what to make of the findings, investigators collected several items into evidence. Transylvania County authorities began trying to track down the victim's family to inform them of Wendy's tragic death. At autopsy, medical examiner Dr. Robert Thompson looked to the victim for clues that could explain the crash. He found no traces of drugs or alcohol in the victim's blood or tissue. Wendy's death had resulted from blunt force injuries to the head. She had suffered five individual fractures to the top and back of her skull. Though Wendy had not been wearing a seatbelt, for Dr. Thompson, the location and number of injuries were not typical of car crash victims. Usually injuries that we find with automobile accidents are those in the, the face areas where the, the face comes down and hits the dashboard. So the injuries that are found were not really consistent with the automobile accident, although conceivably it could have happened that way. The autopsy results prompted investigators from the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation to take a closer look at Wendy Kratzert's accident. Special agent and blood spatter expert Andy Klein reviewed photographs taken at the scene. He was immediately struck by the lack of blood found where the victim's body came to rest. From the, the position that she came to rest in with her head in the passenger side floorboard, uh, and with the wound being to the, the top and the back of her head, I would have expected to see a larger pool of blood in that floorboard had she received that wound in the van. More troubling, however, was the presence of the victim's blood on the vehicle's exterior running board. There was several blood spatters that I noted uh, on the running board portion of the vehicle that would have been protected had the door been shut. So at some point, the door was open and she bled on it. All of the evidence suggested that Wendy Kratzert had been bleeding before she ever got into the van. The routine death investigation had raised more questions than answers. Police learned that Wendy and her husband owned a vacation home a few miles away from the scene of the accident. Later that night, authorities went to the address. 
no one appeared to be home. Then they discovered a large pool of blood. Tests later confirmed it had come from Wendy Kratzert. An earring back, identical to the one found inside the van, was located a few inches away. Technicians concluded that no one could have survived such blood loss without immediate medical attention. Nearby, investigators found the outline of an object. Its shape was similar to the blood-stained cinder block found inside the van. For police, there could be no doubt that Wendy Kratzert had been brutally murdered. Her death had been staged to appear as an accident. After obtaining a warrant, the team made their way into the residence, unsure of what or who they might find. No one was home. And the residence showed no signs of forced entry or ransacking. Investigators thoroughly photographed the scene. They also collected numerous personal items and papers that belonged to the victim. Now, investigators had to determine who had killed Wendy and why. Transylvania County Police were eager to question Wendy's husband, Ed. He was tracked down to his home in Bradenton, Florida. Police there were contacted and asked to speak to the victim's husband. Ed Kratzer couldn't believe his wife had been murdered. He stated that since the couple's children graduated from high school, Wendy had been spending a lot of time at their vacation home in North Carolina. Ed explained that he had recently suffered a heart attack and was at home at the time of the murder. Wendy had helped nurse him back to health. And soon after, she decided to return to North Carolina by herself. Wendy enjoyed her independence. She had even taken a part-time job as a waitress in North Carolina. Like I said, you know, I don't want to push anything too early right now. Ed couldn't think of anyone who might want to harm her. Florida police confirmed Ed's alibi. And soon after, he was cleared as a suspect. Police and forensic examiners had exposed a tragic car accident as an elaborate attempt to conceal a brutal crime. But with few leads and no obvious suspects, it appeared that Wendy Kratzert's killer might get away with murder. In Transylvania County, North Carolina, a routine traffic death investigation had exposed a brutal homicide. 45-year-old Wendy Kratzert had been savagely beaten to death. Her body placed in a van, which was then pushed over a steep cliff. Frustrated by the lack of suspects or an obvious motive, police in Wendy's hometown of Bradenton, Florida, questioned the victim's friends and neighbors. One close friend told police she could think of only one person who might want to harm Wendy, and that was her husband, Ed Kratzert. Wendy had described him as ruthlessly controlling. He watched over her every move and was extremely critical of her behavior. Wendy said he could also be physically abusive. Things had become even more strained after Ed's heart attack. The medical bills had left the couple in severe financial trouble. Just before her death, Wendy had talked about leaving her husband. The findings were passed on to police in North Carolina, where Wendy's murder took place. 
Following up on the information, investigators learned that Ed Kratzert stood to gain $100,000 from Wendy's death. But so far, he had made no attempts to collect on his wife's insurance policy. Though Ed had misrepresented his relationship with Wendy, he had a solid alibi, and there was no motive connecting him to the crime. Desperate to identify Wendy's killer, detectives questioned her co-workers at the local restaurant where she worked part-time. One recalled that just before her death, Wendy had been tired and irritable. She said she had been dealing with unexpected house guests who had shown up from Florida on a few occasions. The co-worker didn't know the name of the visitors, but it was clear to Transylvania homicide detective Rita Smith that Wendy was not happy to have them in her house. Wendy had been very uncomfortable with these people, that um, they had smoked in her house, uh, that she felt that they had pilfered through her belongings. Looking to identify the house guests, investigators scoured through the items collected from Wendy's vacation home. They found a potential clue. The names Tom and Luana Harrison had been handwritten on Wendy's calendar. And a records check revealed that the Harrisons lived in the same Bradenton, Florida neighborhood as Wendy and her husband. Florida police were dispatched to the Harrisons' home to question the couple. They admitted having visited Wendy in North Carolina a few weeks prior to her death. Tom explained that he and Luana were close friends of the Kratzerts. They spent a lot of time with the couple. They hadn't noticed any problems between Ed and Wendy. Wendy invited them to come stay at their North Carolina home whenever they wanted. She even gave them a key to the house. They took her up on the offer. But that was weeks before her murder. They hadn't been back since. As a matter of routine, the officer asked the couple their whereabouts at the time of Wendy's murder. Tom Harrison suddenly became agitated. He felt he was being treated like a suspect. He ended the interview and asked the officer to leave. Tom Harrison's odd behavior led police to believe he was hiding something. This timeline here to find out what, they subpoenaed his credit card statements for the weeks surrounding the murder. They found that numerous charges had been made to hotels and car rental agencies throughout North Carolina. In fact, the receipts put Tom and Luana Harrison near the scene of the crime in the days before and just after the murder. Tom Harrison had been caught in a lie. Though police could find no motive, the circumstantial evidence was pointing to the Harrisons as Wendy Kratzert's killers. Agents from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement were contacted. They were asked to take Tom Harrison and his wife, Luana, into custody. As FDLE Special Agent Vince Delacchio prepared to put his team together, he received some startling news. Tom Harrison was dead. I'd come in in the morning and received a phone call from the Manatee County Sheriff's Office. The investigator there asked me if I had seen the front page of the morning paper. The front headline was, uh, Local Man Dies in Boating Accident. According to reports, authorities had discovered Tom Harrison's boat burning out of control in the Gulf of Mexico. After putting out the blaze, rescue workers began a massive search to find the owner. For several days, efforts to find Tom Harrison turned up nothing. Soon after, the search was called off. The prime suspect in Wendy Kratzert's homicide was missing and presumed dead.
Authorities in North Carolina believe they had finally identified the killer of 45-year-old Wendy Kratzert, whose brutal murder had been staged to look like a car accident. But as they prepared to make the arrest, they learned that their prime suspect was missing and presumed dead after his boat was found burning in the Gulf of Mexico. But authorities were convinced that Tom Harrison had staged his own death in an attempt to throw investigators off his trail. Lieutenant Marty Redmond of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission was asked to find out. When I got to the scene and, and looked at the boat, I saw a vessel approximately 25 feet long that used to be a cabin type boat. The boat had burned completely to the waterline, excepting certain portions of the starboard bow and the starboard quarter. Fire marshals were able to quickly rule out electrical problems as the source of the blaze. After carefully analyzing the burnt remains, investigators found that some places on the boat had burned at a much higher temperature than others. And wood marred with deep, scaly scars, referred to as alligator patterns, was found next to wood that was nearly untouched by the fire. There was only one explanation for the uneven burn patterns. The fire marshal's office determined that the fire was started with a, an accelerant and wear in the boat that it was started uh, by indicators from burn patterns, uh, different melting points of certain materials, and other items that they are skilled in looking for in, in charred ashes or charred remains of fires. The fire had been intentionally set. And having found no traces of human remains among the debris, investigators were certain that Tom Harrison had set it. Lieutenant Redmond questioned Tom Harrison's wife, Luana. Careful not to reveal that examiners had exposed arson, he asked her about the circumstances surrounding her husband's mysterious death. She claimed that on the night of the fire, Tom hadn't been feeling well. After watching a late night football game, he told her he wanted to go fishing. Concerned for his health, she tried to stop him. But there was little she could do. Tom packed up his fishing gear and left a short while later. For investigators, Luana did not appear to be the grieving widow who had just lost her husband of more than 20 years. Her only concerns were with quickly closing the investigation into Tom's death. Police soon learned why. In addition to being suspects in Wendy Kratzert's homicide, the Harrisons were in deep financial trouble and Luana stood to collect a large life insurance settlement as a result of Tom's death. Florida Department of Law Enforcement Special Agent Vince Delacchio. But I knew at that point in time that Thomas Harrison was not dead and that uh, this boating action was, was more than likely a staged event just to hide from the fact that uh, he was a suspect in that case and probably more than likely in, in knowing his situation that he was looking for some insurance money. To test the theory, authorities put 24-hour surveillance on the Harrison's Bradenton, Florida home. Months passed without a break. But then, police spotted Tom Harrison alive and well. And it appeared that he and Luana were preparing to leave town. Shortly after the couple hit the road, police pulled them over. Tom Harrison gave the officer a fake name and driver's license.
He and Luana were placed under arrest and charged with insurance fraud and arson. But Tom Harrison was uncooperative, and with no hard evidence tying him to the homicide, investigators were still a long way from proving that he had murdered Wendy Kratzer. For police, the Harrisons' close ties with the victim's husband could no longer be ignored. Investigators began to theorize that Ed Kratzert, unhappy in his marriage to Wendy, had hired the Harrisons to kill her. The time was right to recontact Ed Kratzert, the husband of the victim, and um, attempt to conduct another interview. Uh, with the fact that uh, Harrison had been arrested, we felt as though that would open up the dialogue with, with Mr. Kratzer. Kratzer was brought in for questioning and informed of Harrison's arrest. Investigators confronted him with their murder for hire theory and insinuated they had evidence to back it up. It was a bluff, but it worked. Ed Kratzer decided to talk. He confessed to taking part in the plot to murder his wife. He insisted it wasn't his idea. Kratzert said that he was complaining to the Harrisons about his marriage. He knew Wendy was planning to leave him. After his heart attack, he was dreading the idea of a prolonged divorce and separation of assets. Tom Harrison told him he could make his problem go away for a fee. Ed agreed. The death was supposed to look like an accident. When it was exposed as a murder, Ed refused to collect on his wife's life insurance policy. The Harrisons were never paid for the job. As a result, Ed feared that Tom Harrison was plotting to kill him. Ed Kratzert was placed under arrest and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Police confronted Tom Harrison with the statements. He refused to cooperate, but it made no difference. The credit card receipts that put him near the crime scene at the time of the murder, coupled with Ed Kratzert's confession, was all police needed to charge him with the homicide. Police believe that after showing up unexpectedly at Wendy's North Carolina vacation home, Tom Harrison bludgeoned the unsuspecting woman to death. After the kill, the couple loaded Wendy's body into her van and drove to a remote spot along the Blue Ridge Parkway, where they then attempted to stage her death as a car accident. Ed Kratzert was found guilty of the first-degree murder of his wife and received a sentence of no less than 11 years. Tom Harrison was sentenced to 20 years. In exchange for her testimony, Luana Harrison received three years probation. The Harrisons had tried to get away with murder by staging an elaborate accident. But in 1995, in the suburbs of Sarasota, Florida, one killer made no attempt to cover up his actions. On the afternoon of November 7th, 13-year-old Stevie Bellish returned home from school. No one appeared to be home. But then she stumbled upon a horrifying scene. Her mother, 35-year-old Sheila Bellish, lay dead on the kitchen floor. Panicked, the young girl called 911. Deputies and forensic technicians from the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office were immediately dispatched to the home. To prevent any contamination, a single forensic technician was allowed to enter the residence and document the scene. Sheila Bellish had been brutally murdered. 
she had suffered a single gunshot wound to the cheek. There were also indications that she had been viciously beaten. Her throat was so deeply cut, she was almost decapitated. As technicians began processing the crime scene, the victim's husband, Jamie Bellish, arrived home. Detectives broke the news. Police assured him that his stepdaughter, Stevie, and the couple's newly born quadruplets were all safe and unharmed. The frantic husband was escorted away from the house and taken to the police station to answer questions. Technicians looked to the blood evidence to help them piece together the events that transpired inside the house. Based on the size and location of blood spatter patterns, they determined that Sheila Bellish was initially shot near a door that led to the laundry room. Streaks of blood suggested she then attempted to crawl away from her attacker. But she was only able to get a few feet away before her killer caught up with her and slashed her throat. There was nothing to suggest that robbery was the motive. In the laundry room adjacent to the kitchen, technicians located a single 45 caliber shell casing. A few feet away lay a white towel. Some of the fabric was covered with gunshot residue, suggesting it had been used as a makeshift silencer. But for some reason, the killer only got off one shot before using a knife to finish the job. Evidence technician Lisa Lanham tried to make sense of the excessive violence inflicted on Sheila Bellish. There are two possibilities of why he abandoned the gun. One is that the gun is very loud in a small confined area and probably sounds even louder when you're the one shooting it. And he may have feared that the neighbors would overhear the weapon. The other possibility is that the towel got caught in the gun and then basically made the gun inoperable. Looking for any trace of the killer that may have been left behind, technicians collected dozens of prints from throughout the residence, including some found inches from the bullet casing. All of the evidence was forwarded to the Sarasota County Crime Lab. Homicide detective Chris Iorio was assigned lead detective on the case. All I knew at that point was we did have a uh, mother of uh, six kids, deceased in the kitchen, head trauma. Uh, most likely a um, gunshot was involved, and uh, we took it from there. Investigators know from experience that their best opportunity to solve a murder falls within the first 24 hours. With few clues and no obvious suspects, they hoped an autopsy could point them to this brutal killer. Police in Sarasota, Florida, struggled to find answers in the death of 35-year-old Sheila Bellish, a mother of six found brutally murdered in her home. At autopsy, the medical examiner recovered a 45 caliber bullet that had been fired from close range into the victim's face. It had shattered her jaw, but it was not the cause of death. A single knife wound had severed the victim's left and right jugular veins. Sheila Bellish had bled to death. There were no signs of sexual assault, and no clues to the killer's identity were found. The overkill observed at the crime scene led police to suspect that the killer was someone close to the victim. Sheila's husband, Jamie Bellish, was brought in to answer questions. He described Sheila as a dedicated mother and a loving wife. Jamie explained that he and Sheila and her two children from a previous marriage had recently moved to Florida from San Antonio, Texas. Sheila had just been through a nasty divorce. 
And when she and her new husband learned they were going to have quadruplets, they decided to start their lives over in a new city. The decision to move had not been an easy one. But according to Jamie, Sheila's ex-husband continued harassing her, even after the divorce was finalized. Jamie said that at the time of the murder, he was at work. But homicide detective Chris Iorio was taking nothing for granted. At the beginning of the case, uh, Jamie Bellish was our obvious suspect uh, due to uh, just his role in uh, the family structure. But uh, within, I'd say, four or five hours after we responded, we felt pretty sure that he was not involved. Detective Iorio contacted authorities in San Antonio, Texas, and asked them to speak with Sheila's ex-husband about the murder. Alan Blackthorne, a wealthy businessman, admitted that his divorce from Sheila had been bitter. But he insisted he never would have harmed the mother of his children. At the time of the murder, he was on a golfing trip in Arizona. And he had the receipts and documents to prove it. And did anybody travel with you on this flight? With no suspects and no obvious motive for the killing, Sarasota police turned to the physical evidence for clues. Examiners found a fingerprint that did not match any of the Bellish family members. And it had been found just inches away from the spent bullet casing. The evidence put investigators one step closer to identifying Sheila's killer. Now they needed to find out who had left that print. Detectives returned to the Bellish neighborhood to question residents about the day of the murder. One recalled seeing a Hispanic man dressed in military camouflage getting out of a white car and walking through the neighborhood. The neighbor didn't get a good look at the man's face, but was able to recall a few numbers from the license plate. When we heard about uh, an Hispanic man walking through the neighborhood in camouflage, we knew that uh, most likely he didn't belong to that neighborhood. It was mostly a uh, retirement community, and uh, nobody wears camouflage in this heat. And uh, evidently it was a long sleeve shirt, long pants, and that just uh, stood out. A description of the man and details of the homicide were released through area newspapers. A short while later, police got a tip. A clerk who worked at a convenience store a few miles from the crime scene told police that he also saw the Hispanic man dressed in camouflage around the time of Sheila's murder. I showed him some directions on the map. The man had come in looking for directions. In fact, he was trying to locate the neighborhood where the young mother was found murdered. The clerk handed the man his laminated map of the area. He added that the stranger got into a white car and drove off. Officers collected the laminated map, hopeful the suspect had left his prints behind. At the crime lab, examiners located several prints on the map. Evidence technician Lisa Lanham then compared them to the suspect's prints that were recovered from the crime scene. She found a match. Police had identified a suspect and had evidence that could tie him to the crime scene. Now they needed to know his name. All they had was a partial license plate number from his vehicle. It wasn't much to go on. We initially ran a tag out of Florida. I mean, a lead's a lead, you have to try. And it came back to nothing. And then we decided, since the Bellishes were from Texas, that'd be the next state to try. And uh, when we got that tag, uh, the information back, it, it was registered to somebody in Texas, so we had to follow up that lead. Investigators traced the white vehicle to a 21-year-old Austin, Texas resident named Jose Joey Del Toro. We ran a background check on Jose Del Toro. As soon as we got his name, we did find out that he had a he had a criminal history, but not nothing that would make you believe he was a murderer. 
But that was a conclusion forensic scientists would have to make. Joey Del Toro's fingerprint card was forwarded to the Sarasota County Crime Lab. There, examiners compared his prints to those recovered from the Bellish home. After careful scrutiny, they concluded that Joey Del Toro had left the print. A warrant was issued for his arrest. Police in Del Toro's hometown of Austin, Texas, were unable to track down the suspect. However, they did manage to locate his white vehicle. Armed with a warrant, investigators processed the car. Inside a bag, they collected a Colt 45 caliber semi-automatic handgun. It was the same type of weapon used to shoot Sheila Bellish. To nail their case against Joey Del Toro, investigators forwarded the weapon to ballistics experts at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab. First, the weapon was fired into a water tank. The water slows the bullet's flight without distorting the unique marks left behind as it passes through the gun barrel. The rounds collected from the water tank could then be compared to the bullet recovered from Sheila Bellish's cheek. Under a comparison microscope, examiners found that the striation marks that are unique to each gun were identical on both bullets. All of the forensic analysis left investigators with no doubt that Joey Del Toro had murdered the young mother of six. But having found no obvious connection between the killer and the victim, the motive behind the savage slaying was as mysterious as the killer's whereabouts. Police in Sarasota, Florida had finally linked a suspect to the murder of 35-year-old mother of six, Sheila Bellish, found brutally beaten, shot, and stabbed in her home. All of the evidence suggested that 21-year-old Joey Del Toro committed the murder and then fled to Texas. But so far, all efforts to locate him had gone unsuccessful. Then, police got a tip that the fugitive was staying with relatives in San Antonio. For help, Florida police contacted the Texas Rangers stationed there. But authorities there had no luck finding the suspect. However, they managed to track down his cousin, a man named Sammy Gonzalez. He agreed to come in and answer questions. Texas Rangers Lieutenant Gary De Los Santos conducted the interview. Sammy Gonzalez claimed he had no idea where his cousin, Joey Del Toro, might be. But he believed he had information about the murder. He said that a few months back, an acquaintance of his, a golf hustler named Danny Rocha, had tried to hire him to beat somebody up. Sammy was interested in the job, but when he saw the intended victim, he declined. But he knew someone else who might be interested in the job. Sammy admitted to us that uh, he was approached by Danny Rocha and was asked to uh, beat up a girl. Uh, once uh, Sammy realized it was a woman, he refused to do it, but uh, he brought up to Joey, his cousin, Joey Del Toro, that maybe he would be willing to do it. Sammy claimed that he didn't know if his cousin had taken the job. And he didn't ask why the woman had been targeted. Okay. Unsure what to make of the information, investigators began digging into the golf hustler's background. They were surprised by what they found. Danny Rocha was a close associate of Sheila Bellish's wealthy ex-husband. Suddenly, Investigators had to consider that they had exposed a murder-for-hire scheme. Police knew that Sheila's divorce had been bitter. But had it led to murder? 
business. One friend who knew the couple well thought so. Sheila had described her ex-husband, Alan Blackthorne, as obsessive and controlling. During their divorce, he had demanded that Sheila sign over custody of their children. When she refused, Blackthorne had her falsely arrested for child abuse. The charges were ultimately dismissed, and Sheila was awarded custody of the children. Alan Blackthorne allegedly said that he would get even. According to the friend, Sheila took the threat seriously. When Sheila and her new family moved to Florida, they kept an unlisted phone number and took pains to keep their new address a secret. Now, investigators look for proof that the victim's ex-husband had orchestrated her murder. Danny Rocha, the person police believe had hired the hitman, was brought in for questioning. Under advice of his attorney, he refused to answer any questions. Before letting him go, however, Lieutenant De Los Santos asked Rocha to pose for a photograph with him. He agreed. The following day, Sammy Gonzalez was brought in for another interview. Police were convinced he knew more about the murder plot than he claimed. When shown the photograph, Sammy became convinced that Danny Rocha was cooperating with authorities. Fearing he had been implicated in the murder, he decided to talk. Now, he admitted that he had accepted $14,000 from Danny Rocha to murder Sheila Bellish. A short while later, he hired his cousin to actually carry out the homicide. Sammy believed that Sheila Bellish's ex-husband, Alan Blackthorne, had ordered and financed the murder. He also told investigators where they could find the hitman, Joey Del Toro. Soon after, Del Toro was tracked down to a motel in Mexico. He was placed under arrest and after extensive legal wrangling, extradited back to the United States to stand trial for murder. Authorities had now exposed three conspirators in the murder of Sheila Bellish. But the alleged mastermind, Alan Blackthorne, was still a free man. Looking to find evidence linking him to the murder, investigators subpoenaed his phone records for the months prior to the homicide. One number that continually popped up was traced to the bail bondsman who had helped Sheila get out of jail when she was falsely arrested. The bondsman said he recorded all of his phone conversations. Police realized that he would have been one of the few people to have a record of Sheila Bellish's most current address. Once we've got those recordings, that's when you hear Alan Blackthorne and there's a person calling and pretending to be somebody else and trying to ascertain Sheila's address. Investigators confirmed that just before the murder, Alan successfully located Sheila's Florida address. The evidence along with the testimony of the other conspirators, was enough to arrest the wealthy businessman. On January 4th, 2000, Alan Blackthorne was taken into custody and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. At trial, police learned that soon after his divorce from Sheila, Alan Blackthorne began plotting to kill her. While on a golfing trip, Blackthorne told his associate, Danny Rocha, that his ex-wife was an abusive mother and he wanted it stopped, even if it meant killing her. Danny Rocha agreed to set it up. After acquiring Sheila's address in Florida, the hitman drove from Texas to the Bellish home.
Joey Del Toro broke into the residence and waited for his opportunity. He caught the unsuspecting mother completely off guard. For their role in the murder, Joey Del Toro and Danny Rocha each received life sentences. Sammy Gonzalez was sentenced to 19 years. Alan Blackthorne was found guilty of orchestrating his wife's death and sentenced to life in prison. For some, money is motive enough to commit murder. When there are no obvious connections between killer and victim, detectives turn to forensic examiners to expose the mastermind behind a murder for hire. <laughs> 